Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pioneer Valley Life. I'm your host, James Sullivan. We're here in the studios of East Hampton's E-Media. Today, my guest is Julian Lowenthal, who is the director, producer, and co-writer of a new film called Money Game. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks. Um, you're a local filmmaker. I am. Uh, I guess the film was... Uh, I saw some information on a couple of websites that it was filmed a lot in the Turner's Falls area. Is that correct? Yeah, so the film's shot entirely in four Western Mass towns. Uh, a lot of it's shot in Turner's Falls, Mass, as well as Greenfield, Mass, but we also shot in Amherst, Mass, and South Deerfield. Oh, huh. yeah, all in the Pioneer Valley. Yes. So it fits in well with the name of the show. <laughs> right. So why don't you give us a little, I know the, it's not for, the film is not in national distribution yet, but I've noticed you've already won quite a few awards in some of the uh, festivals that you've entered. Yes, no, we're very honored. Uh, we just kind of started our festival circuit and just out of the, the gate, the first couple festivals, we were able to, you know, get seven awards just at the very beginning. And uh, now we're going to be having a week long screening at the Greenfield Gardens before we do go to national distribution. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, That uh, it's coming up at the Greenfield Garden Cinema, I think, what, Jan July, June 10th, is that right? Uh, close, June, uh, Friday, June 14th to June 20th. Okay, yeah, good. So, you know, this, this show will get seen by people before then, and, uh, you know, so hopefully you'll get a good, uh, it's there for a whole week, which is good. So yeah. people have the choice to go there whenever. And, um, so why don't you give us a little bit of a uh, synopsis of the film and then discuss what your involvement with the film has been. Wonderful. So Money Game is about a young, single widowed father of two uh, struggling to navigate a broken system while giving his two daughters the life that his late wife promised them, fighting to give them the life that his late wife promised them. Uh huh. And um, you are director, producer, co-writer, um, that covers a lot of area in getting the film. So I guess it sounds like without you, it, you know, you're the whole uh, uh, genesis of the film as well as getting it to a finished product. I really appreciate that. I, I will definitely say this was a huge collaborative effort, uh, but I was definitely very passionate about this from the jump, still very passionate now, and you know, one of my jobs um, was not only helping to get it fundraised, fundraised and developed at the very beginning, but now that we've completed it, really getting it out to the world. Right. Yeah, and that, that is, that is a, uh, you know, an intensive process, I imagine. It is, but it's also a, a fun game that I love to just be part of, and it's something that I want to continue. Right. Because I guess um, uh, you do have some experience in the Hollywood circuit, so to speak, uh, based on you have been involved in some major films in the past before you came and made your own film. Yes, and that also really helped me learn, you know, from how all different size films, you know, run, what works, what doesn't, but also just kind of allowing me to network with all these amazing filmmakers on every one of these sets. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I've always imagined uh, what that might be like, and, and even sometimes I'll be watching TV, and you know, in my mind, I'll be I'll be managing, I'll be imagining what's on the other side, you know, of what the people, the actors are actually looking at. You know, the same way we're here in the studio, we see some cameras, you know, there on a set, you know, it, it must be, you know, it, you know, we see, you know, the action going on, but the actors see something else. Well, I would say like one different, one big like aspect is you got the cameras, you got the lights. But then you got like dozens of crew members yeah. also watching respectfully, you know, yeah, yeah. like doing their jobs right there. So, yeah, it's not only in front of the hot lights, in front of all the cameras, but it's in front of uh, the, entire, the entire crew that, again, it's a very collaborative effort. But I will say there's definitely a lot of pressure on each and individual person and department, especially because like the cast realize, you know, if there's some issue that they do and they have to keep redoing it, you know, it's holding everyone up, just like the crew realizes, you know, as much as you got to be safe with everything you do, if there's something they're doing to hold up, it holds up the whole team. So not only do I love the aspect that's so collaborative, but it's really 
a team effort from everyone in front of the camera to behind the camera. And that's why, again, we, you know, one thing I've seen and I want to continue to see is just both sides just helping the other side to make the best final product. Yeah. How did you get the idea to become involved in this film? I would say it was uh, basically I was working on one film uh, called Don't Look Up, and we had a day, a spontaneous day off. And during that day off, I went to grab breakfast, and I heard, and I heard this wild fan, uh, financial, uh, basically, spiel about how, you know, disconnected finance is, uh, especially to our system now, and, you know, really understanding how companies, even if, especially during the pandemic, even if their revenue is going down, how their stocks still go up, and how it, you know, doesn't make sense, but a big aspect is because of the rigged markets. And so as a non-finance guy, you know, just a storyteller filmmaker, getting to hear uh, this guy who became my partner, Chris Galizio, who has been in Wall Street for decades, talk about how disconnected finance is and how, you know, rigged and skewed it is. I'm like, man, this is something that I feel like the world needs to know. This is something that I feel I'm fascinated by. I think it's wild, but I would love for other people to, to get to see this mathematical, you know, cluster, kind of, kind of messed up cluster in a cinematic film. And so we collaborated to get his, you know, financial basically vision with my cinematic story vision and together we made Money Game. Uh-huh, yeah. How long did it take? Three years, from, uh -huh. I would say from the very beginning of when we first met to developing the storyline, developing the idea to then, you know, getting into pre-production, production, production post and now here we are today yeah and so you were saying that you know mostly it was filmed in four uh, pioneer valley towns and did you recruit a lot of the actors and a lot of the crew from the local area as well or did you bring them in from other places i'm very happy to say the majority of the cast and crew was completely new england based uh -huh. we do have some people from la so, uh, some people from new york but mostly Massachusetts, and then a few of the surrounding states in New England. Uh huh. That's great. Yeah. No, that. Yeah. And, and a lot of locals. I will say uh, this is a union film, so we had to follow a lot of rules both behind the the uh, the camera that union side as well as SAG, which is another yeah. union for actors. But I was very happy to say that even following their rules, we're able to get a lot of uh, locals. You know, mm -hmm. able to give a lot of people that you know, haven't worked on films, a chance to actually get to see what it's like and begin their careers while I got to work with uh, people that I've always admired and gotten to work with uh, on other projects in the past. So it was a very fun reuniting with people that I've loved before and getting to work with a lot of, you know, people I haven't worked with, both that were very local to Western Mass and that was just local to New England as a whole. Yeah. Was the uh, filming uh, affected by the strike at all? We were affected more by COVID. So that we shot, the movie takes place in 2021 to 2022, and we shot during uh, the 2021 peak of the pandemic, right? Uh -huh. 2021, March, April. And so we were lucky that the strikes didn't really affect us at all, but COVID, you know, did affect us. Luckily, one of the many miracles is we didn't have to stop production. No one that was on production got COVID during that time, but we were very adamant about, you know, daily testing. You know, that was just having to follow that protocol while being extra safe during that time. Yeah, that must have been quite the challenge. It was, it, it was a challenge that we overcame, but I would say a big thing was kind of the, how much time it used. And, uh, you know, looking back, I love what we did, but I'm very happy with kind of how things have progressed to this point, that a lot of the extra costs that came with COVID are now no longer an expense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the fundraising part, that's, that's, you know, that's, you know, I know there's a lot of money out there for films because I see films being made all the time. So obviously there's money out there, but it must be hard for a small independent regional, so to speak, filmmaker to kind of bring that about. Well, I would just say, you know, the truth is there's money out there for any endeavor. And it's really just about kind of who you connect with, who you network with. And I will say as challenging as an aspect is for, you know, an independent filmmaker like myself, it's also interesting to hear big, big, you know, 
A-list directors and A-list studios also come into like challenge with certain fundraising. So I feel like it's just a game on its own. And I would just say it's really about, you know, networking. And we live in a world with so many people that it's, again, the money's out there, the people are out there, it's just finding them. Right, right. Yeah, you have investors who want to get a return on their investment, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So that's the next step is, uh, is to get it, you know, so a national distribution deal, correct? Yeah, I would say uh, the next step is again in a month, we got this week long screening. So the next step is to, you know, get everyone aware of the Greenfield Garden Cinema showing. And then after that, really move forward with kind of the distribution uh, plan. Like we've been approached by a lot of different companies. And so at that, so this summer, I'll be, I'm going to be looking to move forward with you know, the company that we feel can best help the movie uh, get, you know, nationwide distribution. Right, right. And um, what part does the, uh, the festival circuit play? From my experience so far with Money Game, uh, the festivals help, you know, get some buzz for the film, help get more exposure. A big, you know, a big component being an independent film is getting the word out there, letting as many people as you know be aware of your film. So I feel the festivals have done a nice part on kind of starting that momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where is some mostly local festivals so far or just some national ones, you know, because I guess it's a year long process. There's I know there's, you know, there's certain festivals that are at certain times of the year, you know, Sundance and whatever else you know, might be out there. Do you aim for some of the bigger ones as well or is it kind of a process of building up? I would say both. So my team has definitely aimed for some of the bigger ones. We also aim for, you know, medium tier as well as the local yeah. uh, festivals. But at this point, we've gone to a couple, mostly on the East Coast, even though we got uh, one. We actually are at this point have two that two L.A. festivals. But I would say so far, everything has been, you know, domestic in terms of festivals. But we have been kind of going uh, around. And like I said, we just started. We've only done the first six festivals, but we got several more coming over the next year. Yeah, but you've got some awards already and that, you know, I saw, you know, the poster that you sent along, uh, you know, present on the poster, it shows, you know, the awards that you've gotten, you know, so that's, that's got to be good to have, be able to put that out there. Yeah, and again, really appreciative, really appreciative to have gotten those. And they also definitely help get the word out there more get more exposure. And I would say, you know, I think that also does help with the other festivals as well as yeah. distribution. Right, right. So one of the other things that you wanted to talk about was that, uh, you know, we're sitting here today, uh, East Hampton's E-Media, which is a community access public TV station. And uh, you said that you got some initial experience and love for filmmaking when you worked or volunteered at Amherst Media, is that correct? That is. Uh, I will say when I was a kid, um, at a very young age, at 12, I fell in love with film and just felt that that was my calling. So at 12 years old, I'm like, no matter what I got to do, I'm going to just do films. And at that point, um, more like when I was 14, 15, 16, I got very much aware of like uh, film schools. And so yeah. I would always dream at that point of, hey, when I'm 17, 18, I would love to go to Hollywood and go to film school there. I realized it was very expensive. Uh, I was hoping to be able to have enough money to be able to go to a film school at that point. But unfortunately, I was not able to afford going to a film school at 18. But because I had such a passion to do films, no matter what, um, I grew up in Amherst. And so every day after school, when I was in high school, I would go to my local public access station just to be able to learn, learn how to film, learn how to edit, learn how to direct people, learn how to produce content. And even though as a teenager, I will say all the products I filmed, if you were to ever, not that I'm suggesting it, watch it now, are very cringy, but they allowed me to learn, you yeah, know? Yeah. And I'm very, very appreciative that I would say, you know, that there are so many public access stations and I want more you know, artists and filmmakers to realize, hey, you have a great resource hub here where you can learn stuff that people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to learn for essentially free. And you can apply that to your career to, you know, maybe you have a job outside of film, but you need to make an advertisement for it. 
cameras. Yeah. You know, you can shoot your own advertisement even if you're not looking to do, again, films. Everything kind of is connected to cinema, especially, again, if you're in whatever industry, you know, say, you know, you're a construction worker, but let's say you have a company, you should advertise that. And again, anyone just, I feel like learning the basics can have a huge knack up to be able to pursue, you know, making their own advertisements or like in my case, going after films, going after making that a sustainable job, going after right. making that a career. And I'm very blessed, not only for Amherst Media, but for all these public access stations. And I would love if, you know, more towns are able to afford to have them. So people across the board are able to at least dabble, try it, see what they like. And one of the big misconceptions I think in film is there's not just, you know, it's not just about directing, acting, being a camera person. There is hundreds of jobs all over, you know, from all different levels. And I just feel, you know, even just starting at a public access, you can kind of get an idea of, whoa, there's so much to this. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing that, you know, the, the, we try to get that story out here on East Hampton E Media is that this tremendous opportunity exists for residents of East Hampton. Uh, Northampton has its own uh, media station. Their residents have the same access. Uh, and you get the access to studio time, but also the ability to take out equipment and do things on your own out in the field and just learn how to run a camera, learn how to do all sorts of things. And then they've got the editing uh, ability here as well, so that people can come from, you know, just uh, some idea someday to a finished product at some point, and for very little money. You know, becoming a member here at this station is very, very affordable, extremely affordable. Uh, and it, the opportunity to, to take out a camera, to go do something, to do all of this is amazing. So it gives an opportunity you know, these days, uh, not everybody should go to college. But here, you could come here and get the start on a career of, of whether it be, like you say, on this side of the camera, that side of the camera, all the other jobs that are out there. But you start here, get some exposure to being behind the camera and listening to the a director in the uh, in the uh, in the room saying, uh, "Do this. Focus here. Do that." It's an unbelievable experience that you can gather by being here, and work your way into a job, you know, relatively quickly, you know, with a very specific talent, and that's really all you need, you know, is a talent in something, and you know, things will work out. I completely agree. Also, one other aspect that I you know think's really cool about the whole. Uh, public access circuit is how you guys all seem very connected. So if somebody does a show, say here, or they do it, you know, on the other side of the state, they can work on kind of learning cable distribution, even though it, it's nonprofit and it's not about, you know, necessarily making money from these uh, local access shows. You shoot something here, you can put it on your network, you can then go across the state to put it on other public access yep. stations. Yep. And again, build exposure, start building your own brand. Right, that's the thing, you know, when I, I tell people who are guests on my show that not only will this be seen by the residents of East Hampton and Southampton, but uh, it's also put up on a, a YouTube channel. So anybody with, U, with internet access, no matter where they live, can watch this program. And then through the Telview Connect network, uh, we can upload this program that makes it available to every community TV station in the entire state uh, who wants to you know, present something like this, which is, which is a perfect show for other stations to show because not only do they get to learn a little bit about filmmaking, but they learn a little bit more about what you can actually accomplish at a community TV station. So that, that's, that's great that you've actually come here today to provide all of this information. Well, I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity. And, uh, you know, I want to not only be an advocate for people to go after their dreams, regardless of what your dream is, even if you're you know, not able to afford, say, some of the traditional routes just to go after it, but I also am here to really advocate for more resources like a public access station mm -hmm. in each town. Right, right, yeah. So getting back to the movie, um, 
some of the challenges that you faced in terms of actual filming. Can you go through some of those? Yes, well, not to dwell too much on COVID, but I will say one of the biggest fears every morning tonight was me praying that uh, no one, you know, got COVID, especially, you know, I didn't want any of the cast to get COVID. I didn't want any of the crew to get COVID, but I also didn't want myself to get COVID. And right. as scary as it was, me and the other producers, you know, had those talks. What would happen if the director got COVID? Right. You know, and one of the thoughts was that I would be, thank God again, I did not get COVID. But let's just say hypothetically, uh, if I did, one of the thoughts was that I'd be home basically be doing a zoom and some one of the pas would kind of hook me up to like a monitor which i, I gotta tell you i'm a very hands-on type person a very uh, you know i like to be there in the location so as much as the show must go on and no matter what we'll, we'll make it happen it was a huge relief getting to be on set uh, of my film every day rather than having to work remote because of getting covid yeah, yeah. but that was always a fear one of the many things that would keep me up at night uh, is just, you know, really hoping that no one got that because COVID, any production, big or small, that, get cut, that had to get shut down temporarily or that any actor had to like temporarily leave because of COVID reasons, not only financially is a huge burden, but becomes a huge logistical nightmare for trying to shoot around or work around it. So again, not to keep dwelling on it, but that was one of the biggest fears throughout it. Like it cost a good chunk of money just naturally with everything going well, but man, would that have been catastrophic if we had a shutdown for any COVID related reason. Right, right. And so the, uh, some of the actors, uh, how, did, how, how did that work? How did you find them or how did they find you? I gotta say it was really cool that uh, my lead, Daniel Washington, who plays James in the movie, I worked with him on several productions, but uh, a story that we both like to share is during the rap party of one of the first, the first Netflix film that me and him worked on years ago, I wanna say 2018, 2019, at the rap party, um, I basically just had a feeling. I'm like, hey, you know, one day I'm gonna direct the film starring you. And like, at the time, you probably just thought I was very like excited because we just finished a movie together. But I was very serious about that. Um, and even though, and Daniel has always been a very warm, you know, fun person to be around. But it's just very funny that, you know, he was very nice when I said that, but he didn't quite believe it. But then <laughs> years later, we're working together and he brings that story up to me. He's like, Julian, remember that time that we're at that rap party and you told me that one day, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to be in your film. And hey, I just love that that happened. Daniel was a huge, tremendous part. Not only is he the lead, not only is he one of the co-writers and a producer on the film, but he brought in a lot of talented people as well. So I'm very happy that I got to work with him and other actors, uh, such as Terrence McFadden Jr., who I've worked with on other films, and it was a you know, wonderful game to reunite with all these people. But it was also amazing getting to work with not only a bunch of uh, actors that Daniel recommended new and that have worked with him on many productions but then getting to work with actors that neither of us had worked with before like our second lead katie lynn johnson another phenomenal actress but she's somebody that neither of us worked with till that film and we just all hit it off mm -hmm. <laughs> that helps and then in terms of recruiting uh you know the crew uh did you have to import people from hollywood or did you find people out of new york or something closer boston well, I'll say for years, I was in the union and I would do a lot of, uh, I was in the F Massachusetts Film Union and I would do a lot of projects in Boston where I got to actually meet, I would say the majority of my crew that I got to work with on Money Game. So another amazing kind of reuniting was the amount of people that I've worked with on for years and all these different productions and all the, where they were in all these different departments and I'm like, you know, I got to pull them onto my film to really have the, the dream team that uh, I've always wanted from in front of the camera and behind. A lot of the people, majority of them were from New England. Uh, a few people, like I said, were from New York, but mostly the, the crew, I would say 90 to 95 percent, if not almost 100 percent, were all Massachusetts local. And we got a lot of Western Mass. Uh, crew members involved too, which I was very happy about. Mm -hmm. 
And how, what was the process of uh, choosing uh, locations uh, that, that come up in the movie? Well, from the very jump when Chris, myself, and the other uh, creators were involved, from the story aspect, I always visualized Western Mass, even though initially it was written not for a location in mind. You know, initially we all liked the idea of the state of Massachusetts, but we didn't necessarily have a spot. I just find Turner's Falls, which is the area the movie takes place in and, and where I reside, to be just such a magical little village of a town that I thought it would be really a spectacle to have the movie take place there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I fought uh, very hard to make sure that would be possible. And I'm very appreciative of how warm the community have been and still is to not only have us film there, but now, you know, bringing awareness to the screening at the gardens in Greenfield next month. And uh, I'm just very happy how it all came together from the fact that that was just a spot that I always wanted it to be. We got to be there and then the community was just very happy to, uh, you know, have us film there. Yeah. And it's very welcoming to others that want to film there as well because there's been several films that have not only shot in Turner's Falls, but a lot of the towns around it. And we're hoping to bring up, you know, even more films to the area. Yeah. That started to happen. You know, Shelburne Falls has had, you know, several films made there, uh, you know, big time films that have, you know, gotten national distribution and, and seen all around the world, really. Including, yeah, recently The Holdovers, yes. which I would say I'm very, uh, very excited about. One of the leads, uh, supporting leads in that movie, Naheem Garcia, is one of our leads in uh, Money Game. So that was oh, also really? uh, a very triumphant you know, story and person to be able to bring onto the team. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I say, it's, uh, connections like that have a lot to do with how things work. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Julian, uh, you've told a great story about the movie. Uh, we're going to encourage people to go and see the movie at the Greenfield Garden Cinemas. It'll be there from, you said, June 14th through the 20th, the whole week. Yes. And is it uh, several shows per day or just one show per day? So there's five shows per day, but Sunday. And that's just because uh, we have two events currently. On the opening night, we're going to have a red carp with a lot of the cast and crew Great. Um, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. before the 7 p.m. showing. And then Sunday, the only day that there's four showings is because after our 3.30 uh, afternoon showing, I'm going to be doing a Q&A um, with, you know, with anyone that wants to basically ask me any question about the film. But other than Sunday, five showings a day throughout the entire week. Great. That's great. And, uh, you know, we'll try and get this program up because it is time related. We'll try and get this up as soon as we can. I really appreciate and, that. And, uh, you know, other, I don't know if you're going to some of the other stations, but this uh, program will be available to all of them as well if they want to show it. That so would be I, I communicate with those, with Greenfield, you know, South Deerfield, Mon you know, Monte, all those. I communicate with those in Northampton to say, here's a program that's available that you might want to show to your local audience. So, and like as well, we really appreciate what you've done today to encourage people to come to stations like this to learn how to be you, <laughs> succinctly saying, you know, they're going to get experiences that could translate into being able to do what you have recently been able to do, which is great. Well, I appreciate that, you know, and, and I'm hoping that this can encourage a lot of people to do their path and to really go after what they love or figure out what they love, you know, by maybe getting involved with the community, getting involved with the local access station to kind of seeing what they really enjoy. Right. Well, thanks very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.